I really appreciate the opportunity to give you an update on the work we're doing at Viasite. The vision we have at Viasite is pretty straightforward. Our vision is that we're developing a stem cell derived cell therapy platform and our initial focus is on developing a functional cure for patients with type 1 diabetes. And we've been working in this field for almost a decade and a half. And, and I believe throughout that time, we have established a, a really strong leadership position. We were the first company to uh, describe the uh, going from a stem cell up to a pancreatic cell. First, to describe putting that into a type 1 diabetes model and showing that it could correct the disease. And we're now also the first company to be in the clinic with a, a combination product. We have two islet replacement product candidates in the clinic now. There's very clear paths to approval. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. The patients lose their ability to produce insulin from beta cells. If we can replace those beta shells and we can show insulin production, our product is doing what it was designed to do. So the number of patients in the trials can be relatively small. We're working with world-class partners, um, W.L. Gorin Associates, CRISPR Therapeutics, J&J. Uh, &J. We, we acquired a, a business unit of J&J &J a few years ago that, that fueled our growth. Uh, and we have major opportunities beyond, beyond type 1 diabetes, including insulin requiring type 2, and then many other diseases where you can uh, approach this with a cell therapy. Um, and we have an extensive intellectual property portfolio that I'll introduce. So this slide really summarizes a whole lot of work that's gone on at the company over the last 10 or so years, and it shows how our programs work. So we start with an embryonic stem cell bank that we identified and banked a number of years ago called Site49. Uh, this bank is probably one of the most heavily tested pluripotent stem cell banks in existence. It's been reviewed by regulators at the FDA, at Health Canada, and in, in Europe and green lighted as a starting material for manufacture of our product. We go from that stem cell, we then scale that up, and then we drive through a 12-day differentiation protocol up to a pancreatic progenitor cell that we call PEC-01. Um, these cells are cryogenically stable. We can do all our release assays. Then when we're ready to treat a patient, we take a vial of cells out of that, we thaw it and, and culture it, and then we load it into a device, which is the other part of our technology. So one part is the cells, the other part is the delivery of those cells effectively to the patient. Once in the device, that's where the cells will remain, and we implant that subcutaneously, so under the skin in a patient through a, a fairly simple outpatient procedure. The goal is then to get engraftment of those cells. They stay in the, in the device, they get vascularized, they proliferate, and they differentiate over a couple month period to form all of the elements of a normal human islet, including the beta cells, the alpha cells, uh, producing insulin and glucagon and controlling the blood sugar levels in a, a physiologic normal way. So we're developing a, a multi-generation family of products that uh, use this technology. Um, they're shown here. You can think of these as first, second, and third generation products. The first generation, the one thing that is common to all three of these products is they're delivering the same pancreatic progenitor cells. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So the first product, the first generation is called PEC Direct. It's delivered in a, a device, a macro encapsulation device that has ports engineered into the surface of it that allow direct vascularization. There are some advantages to that that I can talk about after, afterwards if you're interested, um, but it does require immune suppression, just like other organ transplants, and so it's really targeting the high-risk patient population. The second generation product we call PEC and CAP, and this uses a device we call the Encaptra cell delivery device. Um, this is a device that has a semi-permeable membrane that allows the free flow of oxygen and nutrients and proteins across that membrane, uh, but it, is, um, it blocks any cell-cell interaction. And we reported uh, out at ADA last year that that will protect the cells from the host immune system. So this can, opens it up to all type 1 diabetic patients. It is challenging. One of the things you heard in the last one is you, you have to have this without getting too much fibrosis that can interfere with that vascularization, which you need on the surface of these devices to get the diffusion across it. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. 
Uh, and then finally, our more recent program is PECQT. This is a really exciting project that we're doing with CRISPR therapeutics uh, where we're making the cells immune evasive, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So one of the really key things that happened over the last year or so in this program, this is a program, as I said, we've been working on. JDRF has funded us to California Institute of Regen Medicine. So we're really excited to, to report that the cell component of this, as I said, it's a combination product. There's a cell and a device component of it. The cell component of it, we have very good clinical evidence now that those cells, when effectively engrafted, do what they're designed to do. They differentiate to become uh, islet tissue under the skin. So this clinical proof of concept comes from both histological evidence and C-peptide evidence. So you can see the devices up in the right-hand so side of this. You can see the devices that we use to do this. The sentinels are devices that we take out periodically to see how the cells are doing. And below that, you see some histological data. And this is com we have a lot of this data now from patients where, where you see it a graft engraftment, where the cells get well vascularized, you get a, a mass of the, the, the implanted tissue. Um, those cells proliferate and differentiate. What you see there is we stain for insulin, so those are all beta cells in the proportion expected in a normal human islet. So that's the histological data. We have a lot of that with both PEC Direct and PEC and CAP. And more recently with the PEC Direct trial, we now have C peptide evidence. C peptide is a biomarker for insulin. Every time you make an insulin molecule in the body, you make a molecule C peptide. Patients coming in this study are C-peptide negative, meaning they're not able to produce any uh, detectable insulin levels when they start in the study. And if we, after we treat them, you're now making C-peptide, then there's really only one explanation for that, and that's our cells. You can see this is one of our best patients that I'm showing you some data on. This is from a mixed meal tolerance test a year after we implanted um, the cells in the device. And you can see on that mixed meal tolerance test, what you're doing is giving a meal, their blood sugar levels are going up, you expect a response of insulin production, and that's what you see there as the blood sugar levels come down, you want to see that insulin come down, and, and we're seeing that as well. So this is good evidence. It's still early, it's still preliminary, but it at least gives us a, a good feel that these cells do what they're designed to do. So more specifically on PEC Direct, the uh, work we're doing there, as I said, we're targeting the high-risk patient population, given that we do need to use this with immune suppression. That's about 10% of type 1 diabetics. In the U.S., that's about somewhere in the neighborhood of 125 to 150,000 patients. What we've seen, as I just demonstrated to you, is that when we get effective engraftment in those patients, uh, we do see in vivo differentiation of those pancreatic progenitor cells uh, to the endocrine tissue as expected. One thing I didn't mention on that last slide is the patients that we see with the best C-peptide are the ones that correlates with the ones that have the best engraftment data as well. So that's an important uh, uh, coinciding. Uh, the current focus right now is on, of the clinical development is optimizing that engraftment. While we're seeing C-peptide, we're still not at the levels we want to see to get a consistent and robust effect across all patients. And so the, the, the focus is on optimization. One thing I can tell you about this field is until you get into patients, you really don't know what you have. Um, and in fact, the optimization we do is all done in patients. The animal studies really don't give us the information we need to optimize. So that's what we're focusing on right now. We are planning to seek a regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation and have had discussions with the agency on that. So this shows uh, a little bit uh, of our timeline. We're in a, a phase one, two trial on this program. We're now in the optimization of that engraftment phase. Once we have optimized, then that's when we'll have the data in hand that, to file for an RMAT designation. We would continue on we, with about 40 patients. You can power this at 90% to show definitive efficacy. So that's what we'll look to complete in that uh, second phase there, and then have an end of phase two meeting and potentially flip that into a um, registration trial for a BLA. So to summarize on PEC Direct, we have clear clinical endpoints. We expect RMAT designation. Relatively small trials are necessary for the BLA. We have the preliminary clinical evidence 
and we have focus now is on improving that effective engraftment. It's really an engineering challenge at this point, and we're very confident the ability to improve that engraftment and get more of that C-peptide production. On PEC and CAP, it's a little bit different. Um, here, we're looking to expand the franchise to all type 1 diabetic patients by eliminating the need for that immune suppression. Uh, we have a collaboration with Gore that I'll talk about on this. We first, in a, we actually, even though we call this a second generation product, it's the first one we moved into the clinic for, if you think about it, for some obvious reasons. If it was very effective right off the bat, you wouldn't necessarily need the PEC direct for the high risk patients. You could use this for all patients. But we knew from the animal studies that we did that there were very dip, big differences between different animal models. The ones that had very aggressive foreign body responses didn't work so well compared to mice models and such where you have a relatively mild one. So we needed to get in the clinic to find out where humans sat in that spectrum. So we went in with uh, uh, a subtherapeutic dose mainly focused on sentinels and uh, we showed it was safe and well tolerated in these patients. We showed the capture device provided the immune protection that it was designed to do. And we showed that when you did get successful engraftment in regions of the device, that the cells did form islet structures as expected. All of that data was, was uh, presented at the ADA in 2018. Uh, but we also identified and characterized a pretty aggressive foreign body response. And as I said, that was not unexpected. In the models that we had done where we saw an aggressive foreign body response in animals, uh, we did see a lack of cell survival and differentiation. Um, and that's what we were finding in the humans, which told us that we had further work to do on reducing that foreign body response. So in order to do that, we turned to our friends at W.L. Gorin Associates. We formed a collaboration with them uh, about three years ago. Um, and the reason that we're working with Gore is the material of the membrane that we use is expanded PTFE, a medical grade plastic, also known by a trade name Gore-Tex. Okay. And W.L. Gorin Associates is the world's leading company with regards to this material. And importantly, about half of their revenue comes from implantable medical devices using this material. So they are the world's experts. So we began working with Gore. It's been a really great relationship. We screened a number of different membranes, and I'm really pleased to say that we made great progress. Down here on the left, you see the original captor membrane comparing what we found in that aggressive rat model uh, to what we saw in the humans when we went in with that, and very similar results where you got a, a, an aggressive foreign body response and a loss of cells in the device. And now with the no, new GOR membrane, and we've, we've obscured the membrane for proprietary reasons, we now see very good cell survival and about five to 600% increase in the C-peptide production. So that's exciting. Uh, we've now moved that back into the clinic. Um, our initial trials are focused on demonstrating that we have indeed mitigated that foreign body response uh, as we've seen in the animal study. Uh, so it's a sentinel only trial. Uh, we should have data on that towards the end of this year, early next year, and based on if, it's, uh, if we see uh, what we saw in the rat model, then we would be on to a dose finding. We know that the cells, when engrafted, do the job, so we'll, we'll move forward with dose finding and efficacy. So to summarize this program, uh, we have early, cl early clinical results that establish important proof of concepts. We've identified and characterized an aggressive foreign body response to the device and learned from that. We validated preclinical models that was predictive for that clinical experience, and we used that clinical ins insight in collaboration with our friends at W.L. Gore to develop device membranes that resist that foreign body response, and we're now testing that in the clinic. Finally, I'll, I'll just briefly mention the program that we started uh, just a couple years ago, PECQT. Um, and the goal of this program is to make an immunovasive stem cell line. And again, we reached out and are working with what we consider the best company out there when it comes to gene editing, CRISPR Therapeutics. So uh, what we're, this, it's a fairly simple idea of what we're doing here, but with profound ramifications. So we start with our stem cell line, Site 49, that I said has been very well characterized. We use the gene editing technology with CRISPR to knock out certain genes, knock in certain genes, to make it immune evasive. And then we use, take that, show it's still pluripotent, and go to those PECO1 cells that we've shown are effective in the clinic. 
we're making great progress with this. In fact, uh, uh, CRISPR presented at the AASD meeting last month that uh, the first line of Site 49 where we made that immunovasive cell line, we showed that it was in vitro uh, immunovasive and showed that we could drive that to PECO1. This not only powers the PECQT program, but obviously if you have an uh, immunovasive pluripotent stem cell line, you can make any cell in the body if you know how to drive it. And so it opens up many other opportunities for the companies. So where, where we are uh, on that program is, is very exciting, but the other thing I just want to mention is we have a really expansive and controlling intellectual property position. Uh, two companies, Viasite and J&J's Biologics Division, were filing the vast majority of patents in this field over the last 15 years. About four years ago, we brought Betalogics into Viasite, acquiring all the assets from J&J. And that gave us a combined portfolio today of over 500, actually it's about almost 600 issued patents worldwide in the space, about 100 in, issued in the US, and still about 400 plus pending applications. And we cover all aspects of going from a, a pluripotent stem cell all the way through to seven stages of cell differentiation. So finally, the, I think we have the products, we have the plan, and we have the team to, to really deliver a cure. We have three product candidates, um, two of which are in the clinic, clear pass to approval, dominant intellectual property position, uh, world-class partners with CRISPR and W.L. Gore and J&J &J through the Betalogics acquisition. And last year, at the end of the year, we secured $105 million, including $80 million from Bain Capital, RA Capital, and TPG Capital to fuel our growth. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>